Dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, welcome to our today's uh, seminar. Uh, so it is uh, my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Kapel Pere from uh, CNRS and uh, UNS. So he's a, a young researcher, I would say, uh, with a very uh, with, yeah, with, with, with a research activity of, uh, of uh, huge impact, so he's very much working on uh, topics in optimal transport, uh, applications to machine learning, to data science, but uh, also in optimization. Uh, so there are, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, several connections of uh, his uh, research uh, topic, research activity to the interest of, of our group, of, of our seminar. I would uh, also like to mention that, that uh, he won uh, two prestigious ERC grants and uh, yeah, was uh, invited as a, as a speaker uh, last year to the Congress, uh, to the European Congress of Mathematics. So it is uh, our great pleasure uh, to have him in, in our seminar. Gabriel, you have 45 minutes for the talk. Okay, great. Uh, thanks a lot Radu, for the introduction. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to make some kind of a tutorial, uh, I guess, on, on, on computational optimal transport. So I will not speak much about my own research. I will probably mention a few, few aspects. Um, and uh, I want to stress the interface with the machine learning. So the question is, is can you really do optimal transport for machine learning? And, and in fact, the answer is not so clear. So I will try to to, uh, to, to explain a bit what are the, the key questions and what are pos possible ways to address uh, high dimensional optimal transport. Uh, maybe uh, first a bit of advertisement for the book we wrote with Marco. So if you want to know more about optimal transport, uh, you can just Google computational OT and uh, it's free. So you can just download the book and you have more, much more information that and I would tell you today also links to codes because it's quite important to have also efficient implementation of, of the method uh, I would describe and also for teaching. It's also a great opportunity to, to learn about optimal transport uh, through uh, implementing actually the algorithm. So a bit of, 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 of the motivation of, of why we care about this type of method in, in, in image processing and also machine learning is because there's many problems where you face the question of, of comparing distribution of points, uh, histograms if you want, or probability distribution could be in image processing or in neuroscience where you want to compare shapes together or you want to compare some form of electric activity, for instance, in neuroscience. But I think what we are witnesses nowadays is a shift toward more machine learning type question where the point cloud, if you want, or the distribution becomes very high dimensional. And on the right side here, you can see two typical examples. Uh, the first one is the revolution we are witnessing in, in natural language processing where uh, machine learning tasks now they proceed uh, over uh, embedding of the world. So they, they typically process um, text and collection of text view as point cloud in the embedding space. And for instance, uh, state of the art architecture nowadays are transformers architecture, which are really doing some kind of transportation if you want over the point cloud. So I think it's really relevant to think about natural language processing as being dealing with point cloud if you want. And also, uh, I would say on the right, on computer vision problems, uh, which are often called generative models or unsupervised learning, density fitting, where you want to learn uh, models for the data, for the distribution of images, in order then to regenerate, for instance, new images, to resample new images, and to do other tasks in machine learning. So here, once again, you view the distribution of collection of images as, as a probability distribution in a very high and abstract uh, space. And all these questions, so shape matching and density fittings, you could frame them as just being some kind of, a, I would say, density fitting or parameter estimation problem, where you have observation beta, which is just a big point cloud in, in a space, in oxygen space, for instance, and you want to fit a model alpha that is parameterized by a parameter theta. It could be, for instance, a, a deep network, typically, in modern application. And, and, and the key question of, of this talk, the, what I will explain, the take-home message, if you want, in that uh, in all these applications, uh, the data set belong to some metric space, could be a Euclidean space with a Euclidean distance, or could be some more complicated space. And you would like to, from, from this metric, little d between pairs of points, to infer a metric that I call here capital D, or discrepancy, in order to, to, to do your fitting. So your fitting problem would be an optimization problem, 
uh, over the space of measure, over the space of, of, of probability distribution. Uh, and an optimal transport will play the role, if you want, of lifting this metric little d between pairs of points to uh, the metric capital D between groups of points or uh, probability distribution. And of course, as you might guess, this would be quite, uh, I mean, quite demanding in terms of computation. So I will try to explain the type of algorithm that scales to this type of problem. And also in high dimension, there are also issues in terms of, of, of statistical efficiency of this method of, of what, is the, what is the error you make when you discretize your problem. If you want. So I, I want to, to challenge these two questions so speed and uh, statistical, uh, statistical performance, if you want. First of all, let me recap a bit of the story and recap the formulation of, of optimal transport. Of course, I mean, initially it was uh, framed on, and formulated by Gaspar Monge more than 200 years ago as a matching problem. You have two groups of points and you want to find the optimal bijection sigma between the two group of points in order to minimize some notion of cost. So for Monge, it was just the distance. It was for military application. And of course, as you might guess, uh, ask like this, it seems like an intractable problem because it looks like you had to go to uh, test all possible permutation and, and this would be intractable. So first there is a mathematical question of how can you be faster than just like uh, combinatorial optimization where you would test all possible permutation. Okay, but, so this is the first na naive, naive problem, but I think there are more deep problems if you want. Uh, for instance, what happens if you have not the same number of points? So, so, so what happens if you want to put weights, for instance, on, on, on the points, if you think like one point have uh, more mass or more influence than the other. So in fact, you, you, you clearly see that permutation, if you want, is not somehow the good way to model the problem. And, and really you want to relax this notion of, of transportation and, and, and really operate over distribution of mass rather than just a, a set of points. And somehow this is a revolution of Kantorovich. So second step, if you want, a modern formulation, which is uh, the one that would, I mean, everybody would be using and that I would be using in my talk, uh, which is a general formulation of what is a modern formulation. I would restrict my attention just to discrete probability distribution for the sake of simplicity. But everything that I say, of course, still works if you have, uh, for instance, continuous densities and, and, and arbitrary distribution. But just for the sake of the, uh, exposition, I would consider I have points xi and yj with weight ai and bj, which are histograms if you want. Okay. And the question of Kantorovich is how do you transport the mass from, from the red to the blue? And the genius or, or the revolution is to introduce some kind of a fuzzy notion of transport where the transport is described by what is often called a coupling or a transportation plan. So for Kantorovich, uh, the meaning was really planification of economy. If you want, you have uh, uh, production and consumption, and P will play the role of uh, planification. Okay, and each time you have a non-zero element, P i j in this uh, in this big array of number, it it means you will transfer some amount of mass between A i and B j. Okay, so the purple points here indicates uh, some transportation is happening, and of course, what you need now to satisfy is the conservation of mass. And in this language, the conservation of mass is pretty simple. You just need to sum your arrays over all the the rows, and then you need to uh, to come back to A. So uh, it simply means that uh, all the mass of A would be distributed in this array of number. And the same thing, if you sum over the column, then you need to, to, to find B. So in matrix vector notation, if you want, it's quite convenient. It means that P times the vector one should be equal to A and P transpose times the vector one should be equal to B. So you have two sets of affine inequalities, constraints, and one positivity inequality. And then what does it mean to find the optimal transport? It simply means that you decide for some cost you pay. For the sake of simplicity, let's declare that the cost is the, some power P of the distance, but you could put any cost here. And then you minimize the weighted sum of the, of the, of the cost time, uh, the amount of mass that you, that you would transfer. And, and, and the good news here is that it's a linear program. So really it's also the birth of modern optimization in some sense of, of modern, uh, I would say, uh, linear optimization first. And, and, uh, and, and this is a classical optimal transport. And of course, then Kantorovich got the Nobel Prize in economy for, for, for this, also for deriving the dual problem and giving like some kind of economic uh, interpretation if you want for the dual problem. But I think what was the key here is that at the same time as, as uh, Kantorovich proposing this uh, modeling of economy, uh, there was George Danzig that proposed the simplex algorithm, which became somehow immediately uh, the standard algorithm to solve optimal transportation. So it's a combination of, of, of a new model and a new algorithm that makes this uh, immensely popular. 
at least first in economy, and then there is, I mean, more and more application of, of today where, where we start using this for machine learning. But really, this is the birth, if you want, of, 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 of this type of, of, of optimization problem, first for economy. Uh, before discussing a bit the algorithm, let, let's let's take a step back and, and think about what is defined. So this defines a transportation matrix, which is cool. It's nice. It allows you to planify economy and so on. But what I think is more important, or at least very important, is the cost associated to this matching, to this distribution of, of mass. Uh, so if you take the power one over p of the value of this optimization problem, you define the Wasserstein distance. Okay. Uh, first of all, it's a distance, not totally obvious, but it's not hard to show. So it satisfies the triangular inequality. It's zero if and only if alpha is equal to beta, but you will tell me, okay, I know tons of other distance. So why should I care about this particular one that looks a bit painful to compute to tell the truth? Uh, and, 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 and I already said this, but, but this is explained for discrete distribution. But if you replace basically the sum by integrals, uh, you would obtain something that could be defined for arbitrary uh, probability measure. Okay, but, but, but once again, why is it important? So if, if you want to, to understand what's happening, the first step is you, to look at the topology induced by this distance. And it turns out that the topology associated to this distance, so what does it mean if you want for two measures to be close one from each other, it's actually the, the, the notion of the convergence in law. Okay, and here for simplicity, I assume I am on the compact space, okay, just, just to, to simplify a bit the exposition. And, and the convergence in law is really a very natural way to compare uh, measures. It's the one that you would use if you are a probabilist and, and want to state, for instance, uh, the central limit theorem. Okay. Uh, for those who don't know, it's, it's also the weak convergence of, 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 of measure. It's simply, uh, you say that a measure converges to another one if all its expectation or all, all its integral converge. It's kind of, a, of a, if you want, a local notion or, a, or convergent on average, if you want. And it's good to, to, to compare uh, this notion of, of convergence with respect to what would be called the strong uh, topology, which is a topology associated to the total variation, for instance. So the total variation of the L1 norm, is you just take the two measures, you compute the difference, and then you compute their total mass or the L1 norm. And if you look at what happens also the simplest case of just one Dirac that would progressively converge to another one, if two Dirac's are not at the same position, then their L1 norm, their L1 distance would be two, because you have a plus one and a minus one. But if you look at what happens for the Wasserstein distance between two Dirac's, since you take the power p and the power one over p, the Wasserstein between two Dirac is exactly equal to the distance itself. So in, it, it is exactly what I mean when I say that the Wasserstein or the optimal transport lifts the ground metric little d to a new metric, to the Wasserstein distance, while respecting, if you want, this, this rule that it should obey, that it should be exactly equal when you evaluate it on Dirac. And, and you can show that it's more or less the only formula to, to, to have this nice property. Okay, and what I've already said, but it's that uh, the topology induced by the Wasserstein distance is actually the, 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 the weak topology, the convergence in law. So you converge in law if and only if you converge for the Wasserstein distance, which explains first why the Wasserstein distance is very popular in probability, because it's a way to give quantitative statement of convergence, for instance, for the central limit theorem. But I think here what is important to realize is that it's also the correct notion, the geometric notion of convergence, if you want to do um, somehow machine learning in a geometrical way. If you want to compare two distributions that might exhibit some shift in their modes, uh, you cannot do this with the L1 norm, and you can do it with the Wasserstein distance. So I mean, this is really the main I mean, take home message is Wasserstein distance is a natural, if you want distance, if you care about um, modes or displacement uh, phenomena, which happens a lot of course in, in shape matching, if you want to register shapes, but also more and more in machine learning. It's quite a, I think, what is important to, to realize. Uh, in terms of algorithms, so it will be mostly name dropping so that you know what are the, I mean, typical uh, alternatives that you get. Of course, it's a linear program, so you can use a uh, simplex algorithm, which roughly have a, a qubit time complexity. So if any is of the order of a few thousand, then it's, it's a good match. It's complete with precision zero, with zero errors in solution. It turned out, and it's quite a celebrated theorem, the birkhoff Neumann theorem, that in the specific case where you have the uniform distribution on two set of points with the same number of points, then actually the solution of Kantorovich is equal to the solution of Monge, meaning that you don't need to split the mass. Okay, so uh, meaning that uh, the solution of Kantorovich problem will actually be a permutation matrix, uh, which is not totally intuitive. Uh, you could say, okay, maybe I have some advantage in terms of economic planning to. To, to split the mass, and the, and the answer is no. If, if the distribution are uniform, you don't take any advantage from it. 
So you can solve actually uh, Kantorovich formulation by solving much problem actually through a dedicated algorithm. And the most famous one is the Hungarian algorithm, which have cubic time complexity. So it's a bit faster than a simplex algorithm. But it, it, it's roughly in the same ballpark, let's say. There is one case that is trivial that you might want to know, but you don't, don't really need to attend to my talk in this case. Uh, in the 1D case, if the point are, are in the 1D axis, then you can easily show that the optimal transport is monotonic, in which case you can solve it by just sorting the points. So the complexity of optimal transport in 1D is n log n. But if you want, as soon as you go to 2D, and this was noticed already by, by Gaspar Monge, and Gaspar Monge already noticed that in 2D it was non-trivial, uh, there is no like obvious way to, to, to compute the optimal transport. I also mentioned here, but I would not describe in detail, that the case of Euclidean distance to the power one, W1, case con considered by Monge actually, has a very specific structure. First, it defines a norm. It's not only a distance, but it's a norm. It, it depends on alpha minus beta. And you can solve it by finding a vector field. So if you discretize uh, what is called uh, mean cost for problem, if you want on a graph, you would have faster algorithms, so typically n square if you have a sparse graph. So the W1 case is very hard in terms of mathematics, but in terms of computation, it's much easier. It's kind of a take home message. Uh, I also mentioned, but I will not describe that, it's, it's also very connected to partial differential equation. First, the equation of conservation of mass, if you write this in terms of, uh, of densities, it's often called the Monge Ampere equation. So solving optimal transport is actually equivalent to solving uh, a nonlinear, very nasty partial differential equation, which you can try to do with finite element, but it's, it's, it's actually not, not so easy. And also, uh, you can try to look for um, some kind of the, the dynamical optimal transport. If you, want. You want, if you want to solve for the progression of mass from the start to the end, this would actually define a geodesic, and, um, which can be computed by solving a convex problem. This was uh, remarked and uh, noted by, by uh, Jean-David Benamou and Yann Brunier. So on the left here, you see the geodesic between uh, Yann and Jean-David. It's very dumb because it's just for fun, because here the mass is the black part of the image, which has absolutely no, no meaning. And you can see how the hair of Jean-David, because Jean-David has more hair than Yann, uh, is spreading all over the place. So it's, it's really to show that optimal transport is definitely not intended to, uh, to do uh, image uh, warping, just for fun. Okay, and then I mentioned that there is also, I mean, very efficient method for, for dimension two and three uh, based on computation of Voronoi cell of, 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 of uh, what are called Lagarde diagram. And this was uh, put forward a lot by, uh, by Quentin Merigo. So in low dimension, there are very efficient algorithm also uh, based on dedicated solver. But I think, I mean, the, what is missing here is that all these approach, they com compute with very high precision the solution of optimal transport. And they are also very specific, I mean, at least for the last one, to the Euclidean case. I think for machine learning application and also data science, you don't really care about having high precision solver. You rather care about having like super fast solver, uh, but that don't really scale well with the precision. So somehow I would say first order method if you want it. In, in, in uh, so you'll be perfectly fine with approximate algorithm, but where each iteration needs to be fast, like quadratic complexity typically, or even linear if you could. Okay, and this is what I want to discuss now is, 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 is this method, they, they would not, I mean, work typically in machine learning pipeline. Uh, what you need is something like more crude, more simple. And in fact, it turned out that it's even older. I mean, the idea that I will introduce is very old. You can trace this uh, all the way uh, to Erwin Schrodinger, a model for, for the lazy gas model. So it's a model for the dynamic of gas. Uh, which turned out to be even older than Kantorovich. Okay? And, and from an optimization perspective, uh, if you think about interior point method, it's, it's just like adding a barrier function to the linear program. And here, the barrier function that you need to use, not really because uh, it's super efficient in terms of barrier function, but because it has a lot of nice property, is a Shannon-Boltzmann entropy. So you simply penalize plus epsilon Shannon-Boltzmann entropy. So of course, for Schrodinger, this was not because he wanted to have a fast solver. It was because it was the model, the lazy gas model, because you have random walks, it introduces some kind of a diffusion. But for us, you see that it also would lead to very nice properties, quite, quite surprisingly. And for those who do uh, probability, you can think of this as like, a, I would say, a maximum entropy method, maximum entropy method for the estimation problem of estimating the entropy. But as epsilon will increase, of course, you would lose precision. You would deviate from the optimal uh, solution because as soon as epsilon is strictly positive, the entropy would be a barrier and, and all p would be non-zero. Okay, so you can really see like epsilon, the temperature would, would somehow 
densifies if you want the transport matrix. So this is a picture to show what happened in, intuitively. On the left is when epsilon is zero, and by Birkhoff von Neumann, we have a bare mutation between the two points. And here I display a little segment. Each time there is a, an element in the matrix that is larger than 10 to the minus two, so that is significantly non-zero. And you see that increasing the temperature makes more and more connection. And the two effects of this, very important effect, in that first of all, the algorithm would be faster and faster. As you increase epsilon, you would gain if you want in terms of, of, of strong convexity, of strict convexity. So the algorithm would, would converge faster, which totally makes sense. Uh, but also the solution would be denser, would be more stable. So in high dimension, this would lead to, so, to quantities that you can estimate uh, with less point, could be estimated more, much more robustly. So the goal of epsilon is to, to fight two things at the same time, first accelerating the algorithm and also scaling better in high dimension. So really you should think of epsilon not only as being, okay, I want to have a fast algorithm, it's also because in high dimension you need regularization. And I will, I will of course come back to this, but, but this is the main, I think, take home message of my talk is regularization is the key to make things work in high dimension. And this is what happened for, for continuous densities. For those who know, there is a famous theorem that is somehow the counterpart of uh, Birkhoff von Neumann theorem for continuous densities. It's the theorem of Jan Brunier that was proved in the 90s uh, that say that if you have at least one of the two measures that has, uh, that has a density with respect to Lebesgue, then there exists a unique optimal transport map, which is solution of Monge. Okay, so it's kind of, of fun because you have the discrete problems where Monge and, and, and Kontorovich are equivalent, and also the continuous problem where you also have a similar equivalent. And here you can see on the left the solution, which is that the contour of its plan is localized on a monotonic map. It's quite hard to see, but there is like a, a map here. And increasing the temperature makes the map blurry in some sense. It introduces a diffusion. Okay, so there is a, a lot of literature and still ongoing uh, lot of studies on, which connect this to large deviation problems, where st they study mathematically this problem, the properties of this problem. We also did our fair share of analysis and what happened when epsilon is small and so on. And so on. But it's not really what I want to discuss today. What I want to discuss and explain in one slide, I hope I will manage to make it, is the, the algorithm, the canonical algorithm to solve one that I love so much that I hope you would share my enthusiasm. And what is fun is this algorithm is even older than Schrodinger. <laughs> you see, we're getting back in time because this was used in the early uh, I mean, 20th century by people that wanted to um, normalized arrays of number. So why is it connected to arrays of number? Because if you write down the first order condition and you introduce Lagrange multiplier, U and V for the two constraints, uh, you, you immediately see that the solution to this maximum entropy method, of course you need to satisfy the conservation of mass, but you also need to be able to factor your P matrix using a Gibbs kernel. It's kind of a, something that happens all the time when you have a maximum entropy method. What is the Gibbs kernel? It's just exponential minus the cost divided by epsilon. So you should think of capital P, a capital K, sorry, if D is the Euclidean matrix and P is two, as a gigantic Gaussian matrix, you have a big Gaussian matrix. And the question is, can you find U and V, where U would multiply the rows and V the column, so that the new matrix, capital P, has the prescribed marginal A and B. And, and initially it was used in the case where A and B, they are one, which means that the matrix needs to be bistochastic. So the question associated to the right-hand side is, can you scale a matrix so that it becomes B stochastic. And this is why it was used to normalize matrix of arrays of numbers. Okay. And the answer is immediately yes. And it's because the optimization problem is strictly convex since it's if and only if, yes, immediately any matrix K with strictly positive number, there is a unique way to scale it toward B stochasticity. Now the question of course is how do you find the U and the V of course? Uh, well, it, there is a very simple heuristic for this. You simply write down the, 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 the constraint conservation of maps. So you have P that should be written as a, the product of a diagonal matrix of U times K times diagonal matrix of V. You multiply it by one on the right and you obtain a very simple equation that U multiplied by KV should be equal to A. And when I say multiply, so the dot with a little circle is just a multiplication of two vectors entry-wise multiplication. But KV is really the multiplication of the matrix K by the vectors, okay? So in fact, solving a Schrodinger problem is equivalent to solving a two equations in two unknown, two bilinear equations in two unknown. Uh, of course, it's not trivial, but, but at least we have reduced optimal transport to the solution of a two equations with two unknown, which are polynomials of degree two, uh, which is not, not trivial, of course. Uh, how can you do this uh, iteratively? You simply give me a V, and then I compute you simply by dividing A by KV. 
by doing this, I solve the red equation. And then I do the same for V. And then it's like chicken and egg problem. It's a fixed point question. Does this iteration converge to a fixed point? If so, we have solved the problem because we know there is a unique solution, blah, 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 and we have solved the problem. And it turned out that it's true, that it converges. And this was proved in a, in a, in a wonderful paper by Sinkhorn in 64. Uh, so this is why I, I love to call this algorithm Sinkhorn because Sinkhorn is not the one who invented the algorithm, but he's the one who proved the convergence. And what is even better is that the proof of convergence is, is like three lines if you want, because it's exactly the same proof that you would use to study a Markov chain. If you want to study the convergence of Markov chain toward equilibrium, so Markov chain is like just a matrix K, you want to, to power iteration on the matrix K, that is a positive matrix, Peron Frobenius, why does it converge to uh, the leading eigenvector? Uh, you can use uh, what is often called uh, Hilbert metric. So it's a distance uh, for which multiplication by a matrix is, is contracting. So in fact, you can easily show by the same argument that uh, these iterations are contracting for the Hilbert metric. So you immediately get a linear rate of convergence and you can study and then do mathematics around it. But, but the proof is, is like the beauty uh, is a gem of, of nonlinear Peron Frobenius uh, theory. So this why I like, I like this algorithm and I like to call it Sinkhorn and that's with other crazy names. Uh, and then complexities, and you can do full complexity analysis. Uh, for instance, you can say, okay, first, each iteration is quite cheap, right? Because it's just a matrix vector multiplication. So each iteration is n square. Now, how many iterations do you need to do? Well, you need to, to set up some criteria for stopping. The criteria would be, okay, I want to have epsilon accuracy with respect to the unregularized optimal transform because I love optimal transport. I want to approximate optimal. If you have another criteria, you could do another analysis. But if your criteria is epsilon precision with respect to the unregularized uh, uh, problems, then you get, I mean, you can show that you need only one over epsilon square. Well, only. This is the bad news, right? Because the complexity is n, is n squared divided by epsilon squared. Uh, if epsilon is large, it's good. But if epsilon is, is, is small, then it's going to be super short. So once again, these are, I mean, nothing in comparison to interior point, where, of course, covariance would be much faster with respect to epsilon. But the good news is that it's very cheap uh, with respect to n, right? So really, the, the regime where this algorithm uh, is, I mean, the state of the art nowadays is the regime where n is huge and epsilon is not so small. So not Gabriel, we, before moving to, to the next slide, yeah. uh, so we have a question, but uh, it, it should be clear. Ah, yes, yeah, so, sorry, sorry. So, uh, and Dirk uh, already answered somehow, is, so the division is entry-wise division. So division is like the inverse uh, of the dot with the circle, but k times u, then it's just matrix multiplication. So the algorithm is really like you, you multiply a matrix by a vector, and then you do just division of two vectors. So the division is very cheap. And the other thing that I want to insist on that makes this very popular in machine learning is that it's very easy to parallelize and to implement on GPU. So I think it's one of the reasons why people love it and, and use it a lot is because it's really easy to use it in the context of deep learning. That's more or less the, the, key, uh, the key aspect here. All right, so I will not explain this, but there is plenty of other problems where you can solve with the same trick. One of these is the wasserstein barry Center introduced by Guillaume Carlier and Marshall Agué. So Marshall died a few years ago, but he was on the, one of the leaders in the field of optimal transport. Uh, and, and you can basically use the same thing on algorithm now to compute Barry center by, by minimizing a weighted sum of a certain distance. So if you're interested in this type of application, we, in the book, there is a chapter dedicated to this. And there are also other variational problems that you can solve with the same algorithm. It's kind of a tool that you can play, use to solve a huge variety of problems. Okay, so now let's, let, let, let's look a bit of what happens if you use it in practice. Uh, first of all, there is a problem, right? Because you add a, an epsilon penalty, which means that this quantity that you define, the sink corn, if you want cost, is not zero if alpha is equal to beta. So you cannot really use it as a distance. Uh, so if you use it, you would see as epsilon increases that uh, if you minimize the distance between alpha and beta, you should obtain alpha equal beta, right? Here you would not. And you would have a solution that shrinks progressively toward the, toward the, the, the center of the distribution. So this would create a bias, if you want, toward uh, the mean of the distribution, which is very bad. So uh, what we, we studied with, uh, with Ojen Ve, who was doing a PhD at the time, is somehow a method to remove this bias that was introduced uh, by, by, by other people um, before, which is kind of a polarization formula, if you want, where you subtract to the quantity that you want to use, here the sink on cost, one half of the cost between alpha and itself, and one half of the cost between beta and itself. So that now this quantity is the bias divergence is zero if alpha is equal to beta. But the, the thing is now you have minus sign. So maybe it becomes actually negative. So it's not clear that this is actually a good idea. 
So what O did is just trying numerically to see what happened, and it seems to work really nice. So we started like studying in theory this quantity that we call uh, single divergence. And the first thing you can look at, which I think is the first move you need to do, is to look at what happened when when epsilon goes to zero, which then was pretty, I mean, already studied in detail by Christian Leonard, for instance. And you can show that it converges to the vast Hirschman distance, and you can even study the rate of convergence and so on. But now, what is quite interesting is the other limits, the limit epsilon tends to plus infinity, where you, you, where, where you can show that actually it converges toward the Euclidean distance. And what, I mean, it raises a question that looks a bit trivial, but it's not totally, totally obvious, is what are actually Euclidean distance on the space of probability distribution, okay? And in fact, this is pretty well known. Uh, people call this often kernel norms. And in the statistics literature, they call them uh, maximum mean discrepancies. Uh, as the name suggests, they are kernel norms. Uh, so how do you, do you compute the kernel norms? Uh, you simply compute the difference, alpha minus beta. And then you integrate twice your difference against the kernel. Okay, So you take your favorite kernel and you integrate it twice. The usual kernel people would choose is usually the Gaussian kernel, right? The simplest kernel, which is positive. Uh, it turned out that here, if you look at the limit, the kernel you need to use is actually minus the cost. Minus the cost, so here the distance to the poor p. So you might say, okay, it looks weird, there is a minus sign. How come minus the cost be a positive quantity? But you have to just to, to, to be careful that here, we are dealing with alpha minus beta. So alpha minus beta is not an arbitrary measure. It's, it's a measure that has zero integrals. And you can show that there exists some distance, which are called, um, somehow negative distance, if you want, or, or conditionally negative distances, uh, for which minus the distance to the power p is actually defining a positive kernel on the space of probability. And the, and the, and the most well-known example is when the, the distance is the Euclidean distance. And, and this kernel is actually often called the energy distance. So to cut the long story short, in short, sorry, in Euclidean space, if you take p between zero and two, it's actually true that uh, minus the Euclidean distance to the power p uh, defines a, a norm over the space of probability distribution. And in fact, for those who, knows, who do a bit of PDEs, um, you would recognize somehow that minus the Euclidean distance to the power p is a green kernel of a fractional Laplacian. Okay, if you want to solve um, an elliptic PDE over the space of distribution, you would, you would introduce this git kernel. This, um, Sorry, this kernel, a green kernel. So in fact, this uh, limit norm, this limit MMD norm, is nothing else than uh, a Sobolev space. Okay. Uh, so so the, the large epsilon limit actually becomes a Sobolev space over the space of distribution. So it's actually a Sobolev space of negative index, or a dual Sobolev space. If you want. So the intuition is, as epsilon goes to zero, you converge to something that is not at all Hilbertian, which is the optimal transport which is not at all a uh, flat space, which is not at all a uh, Hilbertian. But as epsilon goes to plus infinity, on the contrary, you converge to some uh, Hilbertian space, which is like a, a Sobolev space of negative. I don't know if it's clarified what's happening, but at least it tells you that epsilon is a way to interpolate between two totally different types uh, 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 of, of, uh, of geometries, if you want. Okay. So now the question is what happened for, for arbitrary epsilons? Um, and it's not so easy. First of all, you can show that this formula, unfortunately, uh, don't define a distance. In general, it doesn't satisfy the triangular inequality. Uh, what we show is that in Euclidean space, for instance, uh, this is still a positive quantity, which is not much, but at least you can show that this is positive. And you can also show that it defines the same topology. So uh, both um, optimal transport and Sobolev space, they, they, they metrize the weak convergence. Uh, and in between, well, it's kind of an open problem of what's happening, but it's a quantity that uh, that has the same topology. It doesn't mean that it gives the same result because, of course, you are in infinite dimensional space. So two norms define the same topology. It doesn't tell you much about what's happening, uh, but still, at least, it's reassuring uh, in the sense that the topology uh, they behave similarly. Um, this is the first indication of, of that at least it seems to be reasonable. Um, the second step that I want you to, to tell about, um, which same thing is like uh, research in progress, I would say. So it's, it's like indication that these are quantities that are useful, is what happens when you discretize your problem. Because in fact, when you would do machine learning or statistics, what you would have access to is not typically alpha and beta. They would be like random samples drawn from alpha and beta. And, and, and the first step before analyzing anything is, is to, to try to understand how the, the error behaves when you replace your Wasserstein distance by an estimator. For instance, the Wasserstein distance computed from the 
discrete distribution itself. And the answer, it's fairly bad. Okay, the bad news here is, is optimal transport like this cannot work in high dimension because the error you make is of the order of one over n to the power one over d. So as soon as d is like 10 or 20, uh, the number of particles you would need would be enormous. Even if the distribution are super simple, like uniform on a cube, if I just have access to sample, it's it totally impossible to know that they come from cubes in high dimension. It's totally impossible. So you need to have some prior information. Of course, if you tell me already that they come from some cube, maybe I would be more clever. But if I don't have any access, then just the sample is it, doomed to fail. Optimal transport just cannot work in high dimension, at least without extra things. Little remark for those who are into this business, I guess probably not that much, but if some people are interested, uh, it turned out that actually the exponent one over D is not optimal. It's not optimal in the case where alpha is different from beta because it's like a folklore thing that one over n to the power one over D is sharp. Actually, it's not true if alpha is different from beta. And we, we found the optimal exponents in the case P equal two. In the case P equal two, the optimal exponent is actually two divided by D. Uh, and it's an open problem of what is the optimal exponents for general P. For those who are into this business, I think it's a cool problem. Unfortunately, it would still be a very bad exponent. You gain a factor two if you want. And uh, now the good news, or I don't know, but if you want to estimate kernel norms, things are much nicer because kernel norm, when you discretize them, is a bit like doing a Monte Carlo method if you want to estimate an integral with a sum. And then it's like also folklore that Monte Carlo method, they are independent of the dimension. Of course, it's not true because when you say big O notation, it's hide a lot of constants. But in terms of rates, uh, MMD norm, they scale like one over uh, square root of n, which is much better. It doesn't mean that they are better than Wasserstein. It's that two different quantities. So it's like chicken and egg or apple and orange. But at least it's a quantity that you can estimate in high dimension. So just, just to summarize uh, a long list of work, it's, it's, I think it's, a, it's important things to know. And now you might ask what happened for the synchron cost. Uh, and you might guess that it will interpolate between the two, which is true. Uh, as soon as epsilon is strictly positive, you get a rate that is somehow independent of the dimension, meaning it's one over square root of n. But of course, there is no free lunch because the constant will then explode with the dimension inversely proportional to epsilon. So in some sense, uh, if you want to use it as a recipe to estimate the Wasserstein distance, it will not work, of course, because if you want high precision, you would need to scale epsilon in proportion to n, and you would recover, unfortunately, a very bad rate. And, and, and we know it's not possible because, uh, because the exponents above are actually optimal. It's not only that the plugin estimator is bad, it's any estimator that you could come up with, even if you are very clever, they would not be better than one over n to the power one over d. So Syncon, once again, is not a way like this to estimate uh, optimal transport in high dimension. It's just another quantity that you can uh, compute in high dimension. So this raises a lot of problems, a lot of questions of whether you, if you use it on some practical question, would it behave well in high dimension and so on? Well, for now, we just have empirical observation that Syncon seems to work reasonably well. But to tell you the truth, there is very little theory for now that actually applies these results to uh, real problems. Um, which I wanted to conclude my talk on this. Uh, maybe I still have uh, five minutes, five, 10 minutes. Um, I guess so. So 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 no mathematics now. <laughs> Sorry about this. It's just like to explain typical uh, typical scenarios that people would use uh, in machine learning, uh, and and I will not claim that optimal transport is here to solve the problem. So it's kind of making a connection between optimal transport and this type of question, uh, which I already spoke a bit about, which is like parametric model fitting. Of course, the first type of approach that would come to mind, I guess, for a statistician is to say. Uh, the template alpha theta that you need to fit have some kind of a density denoted rho theta with respect to Lebesgue, for instance. And then you would do a maximum likelihood estimator or maybe some Bayesian methods, uh, which when you mean uh, you would somehow minimize minus the log of your density right, of the rho theta, uh, which roughly speaking, if you have a large number of points, is exactly the same as minimizing the relative entropy between your data and your model. So maximum likelihood somehow, I mean, this is the way I view this, is a way to minimize uh, a relative entropy between data and model. Uh, and I think, the, the, of course, the, the, key, the key issue here with this type of approach is, is you, you require as an assumption that all your models, they have a density rho theta. So it's a very, I mean, it's a strong assumption. If it's a Gaussian model, then it, it's true. But the problem is what people, I mean, try to do nowadays is to use deep networks to parameterize their models. 
And, and, and the typical scenario, I mean, the typical model that, that, they, that, that they will be using uh, in machine learning is what they call generative models, uh, where they say, uh, I would describe alpha theta, not by an explicit formula, but by an algorithm, okay, that will be the algorithm that draw samples from alpha theta, because they, they like to draw samples, to, I mean, you'd like to draw new, new, new data sets, what they call deep fake, for instance, uh, which are like fake data. And how do you do this? You just simply generate a point at random in low dimension, let's say according to a uniform law or a Gaussian law in, in low dimension space uh, Z, and then you push forward, you send this point in high dimension through a deep network G. Okay. And of course, now the new probability distribution you have in high dimension would be very singular. So this is why, I mean, this type of approach raises the question of whether maximum likelihood method, they, 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 they can be used. Uh, like this, no. So you need somehow to regularize if you want the, the maximum likelihood. And a way to avoid regularizing this maximum likelihood is simply to draw, I mean, to remove this and to use another type of, of metric, like MMDE, like optimal transport. And this is a recent trend that people have been following recently, is to try to use this type of, of new, uh, it's not really new, but I mean, alternative approach to maximum likelihood. Okay. Uh, of course, this is like insanely complicated, very complicated in terms of optimization, and the mathematics are not here yet, so it raises a lot of questions. But, 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 but the take-home message is to replace uh, relative entropy by something weaker, by something that is uh, uh, continuous with respect to the weak topology, if you want. I would not do a course on, on deep learning, but, but just, okay, if you want to, to, to implement this in practice, what you need to do is to have a generative network, a network that takes as input a point in low dimension and that would output a high dimensional images or text or whatever. So uh, which what people would call like deconvolutional network, that a network that progressively increases the dimension. So if you want, I mean, somehow uh, from a bird eye view, you are just like playing a traditional neural network backward. You know, a neural network will, will usually reduce the dimension. Here you, you rather do it backward. And I think it's a very nice idea actually. Very nice. Um, I would skip the technical details of implementation because as you might guess, uh, it's fairly hard to, 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 to do. Uh, first of all, you need to use some kind of stochastic gradient descent, of course, because uh, here you minimize a, a distance between alpha theta, which is like a continuous density, if you want, and beta, which is an enormous data, data set. So you just like at each iteration compute some kind of a stochastic approximation of the gradient. And of course, here you are totally outside, uh, I mean, classical theory of, of stochastic gradient descent. The gradient is biased, so you cannot ensure convergence, but well, in practice, it seems to work. There are some work, actually, some theoretical work that try to, to prove a uh, few results on convergence of, of this kind of scheme. And from a practical perspective, what you would do, this is just a picture to scare you, but in practice, you would implement this using like PyTorch, for instance, or TensorFlow or JAX, which are like automatic differentiation pipeline that, that, that would handle for you the, the burden of computing the gradient. All right. Um, let's go, uh, how much time do I have, sorry. So, so yeah, so, so just to summarize a bit uh, what's happening here. For, for simple data set, this works well. I mean, this works nicely for like MNIST digits, you can with this generate new digits. If you apply this uh, optimal transport method to complicated Im images, this would not work. And the reason is like using, for instance, the Euclidean distance between images simply doesn't work. And I think the second step that has been uh, instrumental in making this work in practice is due to this uh, guy here, Jan Goodfellow and, and collaborator, which introduced another neural networks, okay? And they call this usually a generative adversarial network method. And, and the new network is called adversarial because it, it replaces the L2 norm by, uh, by a norm that is, is, is parameterized by, the, by another network, okay? So the goal is somehow uh, to, learn the metric if you want or, or to learn a discriminative network that uh, would make that uh, the blue point and the red point they are as distinct as, as possible it's uh, the way uh, this paper and, and follow-up paper introduce this idea is the role of the generative network is to generate uh, a distribution alpha that is as close as possible to beta and the role of the discriminative network is to find a, a cost function if you want that makes, on the contrary, beta as distinct as possible from alpha. And then somehow they sell this idea uh, as some kind of a game theory if you want a problem where you minimize over the generative network and you maximize over the discriminative network. And of course, this is becomes even more complicated to train and it's even more, more questionable in terms of theory. But I think this is, is, is quite interesting. And this is where the state of the art 
uh, is uh, nowadays. Okay, and this is a kind of an animation of what people uh, would be doing, which is using the generative network to, for instance, interpolate between uh, uh, two images. Okay, so how do they do this? Uh, this is not optimal transport. This is simply just a linear straight line in Latin space that you will send through the generative network as the, an interpolation of images. So this is just to explain, I mean, to, to show the complexity of the type of thing that you have learned. And this is not done by our team. We did only numerics on, on very low dimensional uh, data sets. And here it has been done by a team at NVIDIA two years ago. We already have like a lot of, I mean, each, each, each month you have new publications that improve the quality of the image. Okay, so just to summarize uh, the talk somehow. So I think the question is really, can you uh, leverage this um, huge activity, theoretical activity on optimal transport into something that would be practical in high dimension? And I think this goes beyond the current knowledge of optimal transport. I think what is nice is uh, this question uh, from machine learning, they also raised deep question in terms of, of what happened to optimal transport in high dimension, which was not really the focus, I would say, of, of previous work, which was really driven by PDE. So mostly like low dimensional phenomena, and in particular the field medals of Pigali, which is about like the regularity of optimal transport, which, which is, requires very, very complicated and very strong hypothesis that would certainly not uh, hold in high dimension. Uh, something that I think is clear from the end of my talk is that one question, of course, is metric learning. How do you learn the metric? And can you have um, more theoretical uh, warranties on, 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 on the type of metric you could learn? I think this is definitely uh, the bottleneck of, of current uh, optimal transport. And to uh, somehow extend to possible future work, and many people are already working on this, is, is the extension of optimal transport when the data sets belong to different spaces. Because here uh, we learn a cost, but it's still a cost between two measures or two distribution of points in the same space. But there are some scenarios, for instance, uh, if you want to do machine learning from text that is in French and in English, for instance, where the two data sets don't belong to the same space. And it turns out that you can extend optimal transport using IDs from Gromov uh, to this problem um, by somehow asking for uh, some kind of a preservation of isometry between the two spaces. And, uh, and, and the difficulty, then uh, you replace the linear program by a quadratic problem, which is non-convex, and typically NPR to solve. So it raises a lot of interesting questions, which currently are fully open. Okay, sorry if I'm, I'm a bit late, but I will stop here. And if you have uh, questions. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Uh, yeah, very nice uh, results, very clear, very, very nice slides, in that presentation. So we already have uh, some questions in the chat. Uh, yeah, Valentin Boreco, would you like to ask your question? Yes, sure. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, and I wanted to ask uh, some of the questions. One is related to your um, uh, recent work on stochastic deep networks. Um, I've seen that now people are trying to produce adversarial uh, attacks and defenses as well in Wasserstein balls, mm -hmm. uh, as before it was done in LP balls. But uh, in your opinion, does it make sense to think of it uh, for stochastic deep networks? Because it was done for normal networks, like non-stochastic. And uh, yeah, so not the architectures you propose that can map more or less um, uh, mm. measures to measures. Yeah, 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 it's a great question. Uh, but so, okay, I'm not sure I, I, is it exactly what you want to say, but. There is indeed a lot of activities on using Wasserstein distance to do uh, robust optimization or to robustify estimators. Yeah. So here, um, each data point in your sample um, would be a point, and then you do Wasserstein over like a, a measure or distribution on the input. Yeah. Uh, but here it's like another use of Wasserstein where the point itself would be a measure mm -hmm. and where you could okay. use Wasserstein over the space. So okay. if you want to do Wasserstein robust method over point set, it would be like doing Wasserstein over Wasserstein, yeah. which would make sense, it totally makes sense. I think it's a great, great idea. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think the current evolution of deep learning is to use this type of tool more and more because they do a lot of graph networks. You mentioned like our work on, uh, on stochastic, stochastic deep network, which is very close to actually transformer network. Yeah. Uh, so I think this totally makes sense. But this is not trivial. I mean, it's, it requires a, a lot of engineering, but it's certainly something doable to do to do Wasserstein robust method over uh, point cloud network. Uh, cool. 
yeah, it looks like a very cool uh, research program. I mean, you, you should do it. Uh, Thank you. And the second question, uh, you want uh, to ask it? Or? Can, I ask, can I ask about something still to the first question? Because one thing is that these robust networks or whatever they, they have, they, they have this um, visually aligned gradients or whatever, so uh, meaningful gradients. And you can produce like images like uh, in the neighborhood of the, mm -hmm. of the point. It is also interesting like um, how it would uh, work like for the stochastic networks. We should operate in distributions for which the point is a distribution. For sure. I mean, one goal of using Wasserstein is to have better gradients. I mean, it's, it's a way also to, to say that this is a better loss function, is that the gradient have, have, have better qualities. Um, I'm not aware of really like theoretical proof of this, but but I think this would be the, the underlying idea. Okay. Yeah, for Thank sure, you. this makes a lot of sense. Thank you. And um, about the second question, I simply noted it that. Uh, um, there was, uh, I mean, one of the, as you said, that there are these GANs to generate images. There are mm -hmm. also different other methods. Yeah. One of them is that like recently gaining traction is uh, uh, longevity dynamics. Um, yeah. So especially a new longevity dynamics. And uh, usually one has like the convergence in Wasserstein to metric uh, because you have, we have sampling and we have some um, algorithm Markov chain and therefore we want, we, we sort of what, the only thing we can do is we can say that we converge in distribution in some sense, weekly conversion in measures. But um, also there is some type of other work that uh, um, uh, recently have, has proven uh, global convergence in expected function value gap. Um, in your opinion in general, is there a relation between them like for, um, for Langevin dynamics and for... Well, I, I think it's a bit overselling that Langevin dynamics really do sampling of images. I think it works because they do Langevin dynamics over some latent space or they do like a VIE stuff or like this. So I think it's a bit hard to compare GANs to normalizing flow or, or, or VIE. I think they, they need to have some other networks that you need to train. Yeah. So it's a bit hard to untangle uh, what is due to doing to the Langevin dynamics or to the normalizing flow and what is due to uh, the network you use to parameterize your images. So, so it, it, it's really hard. I mean, uh, at least from a theoretical perspective. Then from a practical perspective, you can just look at the image and, and, and take the one that, that, that you like most. But I think it's not what you need to do because the question is not really like quality of images here, it's rather like sampling uh, quality. And the problem is in high dimension, it's, it's totally impossible to really assess sampling quality. So I'm a bit uh, worried. I, I have no answer to give you. But but uh, but for sure you can use uh, the certain theory to assess uh, convergence of Langevin dynamics and so on. So so it makes sense. Yeah, but and this FID so Fresh inception distance. Yeah, but it's just a score. I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. Of course, you could cook up some score, but it's always yeah. a score. Yeah. It's just a way to to. It's yeah. I don't know what to tell you, but but yeah. Okay. Of course, you can find some scores. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it doesn't really tell you how far are the distribution and. Uh, for sure, there are certainly interesting scores to study, but uh, but this for sure this is very different than the Wasserstein distance. You don't expect to be able to have something uh, to have a score that would uh, be uh, really telling you how far the distribution are in terms of Wasserstein distance. I mean, yeah. uh, it looks like an interesting question, but but it's it's it's, it's a difficult one. No, I don't know. I the for the second one, I sort of wanted to ask like if there is a way to frame this convergence. It's not like looking at convergence in Wasserstein metrics. It's sort of not mm -hmm. very uh, uh, straightforward to to, to use for, um, during the process of sampling and to instead this uh, measure of global convergence and expected uh, function value gap that has that has been proven. So both of them were proven for. Okay, for, this I don't know. This I don't know if you, if you can send me a reference. I could have a look. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I'll send it uh, maybe. So then I, then I propose to, to take some other questions later to the yeah, talk. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Okay, so Jonathan? Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, so okay. I was just struck by, you know, the this, um, the, the Schrodinger or whatever perturb mm -hmm. perturbation of the problem. It looks, oh, it looks like, um, looks like a ticken of regularization, but with what we call, you know, with the Kolbeck Leibler distance. Exactly. Right? So, you know, there are like proximal point algorithms. Yep. So, right. so yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, exactly. So, what you can do is you can do proximal point method. And, and if you look at what will happen, is you would simply apply several times in common. So, so, so the right. proximal point method to solve for the 
I didn't spoke about this, but yeah, basically, uh, if you want to solve for the unregularized optimal transport problem, you could use the proximal point method. And, and this would be, I mean, a way to implement this, let's say, let's frame it like this, would be to solve iteratively several right. And, but of course, uh, there is no free lunch. As the algorithm will proceed, it will be slower and slower as you would move closer and closer toward the, if you want to the optimal solution. So it's, uh -huh. it's, 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 there's no, I mean, unfortunately, entropic penalty is not a very good penalty when it comes to high precision. Okay. So, I mean, but I mean, you I, would not have to, you could, you could use a constant epsilon. No, you could use a constant epsilon, but they will accumulate through the proxy. If you look at what happened, I mean, uh, it's mm -hmm. a bit hard to say this uh, during a mm -hmm. talk, but if I had a pen on a paper, I could write the equation and you right. will see that through the proximal point, although you use a fixed epsilon, uh, the kernel will accumulate themselves and it's it's would the kernel okay. would be like the Gibbs kernel if you want would be more and more ill posed. Right. And right. at the end it will still be slow at some point. But but it's to yeah. be expected, right? Uh, of course if you want high precision you should not use uh, x log x, you should just use minus log x for instance, as like uh -huh. a better bio function, but but then you don't have this nice thing on. So <laughs> it's like yeah. unfortunately I yeah. doubt there is like a, something that you can win on both sides like, uh, like yeah. I mean well, well this is kind of typical you know there have been a lot of schemes like this over the years that you apply proximal points so you get a nicely conditioned problem you can do coordinate descent and then there's never any sweet spot mm -hmm. you know I agree. between the inner loop agree. and the outer loop yeah I agree uh, yeah or, or typically there isn't yeah but I think one, one thing that is important is for for machine learning application they are not so interested in having like uh, Epsilon that is small. So mm -hmm. I, I actually, what I want to say really is like Epsilon is, is not like a trick to approximate optimal transport. Like Epsilon in practice is not intended to be very small. And, and it's also here because it's regularized uh, in terms of statistical efficiency of the problem. So it's yeah. kind of the blessing if you want uh, of the problem is that the solution is usually better with large Epsilon if you're in mm. Because you, you don't have enough data set. If you have a lot of data, then you could use small epsilon, but in practice, because of you are in so high dimensional space, you, you don't want to use a small epsilon and then and the algorithm is quite efficient. So it's kind of, mm -hmm. is, is right. the good news, the blessing, the curse and blessing of high dimension is, is you would regularize a lot in high dimension. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? So I have a question, Gabriel. So yep. uh, I read somewhere that thin corn can be seen also as a gradient descent descent algorithm, and uh, so it was a it was a kind of interpretation. And yep. then the, in in such a case, then one could think of uh, providing, let's say, a fast version or like improving the mm -hmm. rate. Yes. So so yes. So exactly. So first of all, it's not exactly true that it could be viewed as a as a gradient descent you could analyze its convergence as a mirror descent, but not on the original objective. So, so, it's, it's, so, so this could, should be ta taken with a grain of salt. But yeah, so what you can do is either you, you do uh, extrapolation on Syncorn and mm -hmm. it accelerates, or you can look at the dual problem and then just do uh, accelerate mirror, accelerated mirror descent, okay. which would not be exactly Syncorn. That would be a bit better. And then you gain a little bit on the right. Uh -huh. so, so, so you can indeed uh, be a bit faster, and in practice, it tends to work a bit better. Okay. So, so yeah, exactly. So, what you say is exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are there other questions? So then uh, we can stop here. Thank you very much for a great talk, Kapir, for a nice discussion. Yeah, thank it you, was uh, our, our pleasure to have you here. So we will uh, post the slides and the video on our website. I just like to announce that uh, the next speaker uh, will next next week will be uh, also in Paris. So this is event sorry, and uh, we will be in an area which uh, yeah is uh, more than tangential optimization. This is uh, the game theory. So uh, I wish you a nice week. Thank you very much. Thank All you. the best. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you. Thank you. At some point. Thank you.